the glare. My spouse found out that I had cheated on him. As for my life, well, that didn't go as planned either. I had visions of a happy, loving marriage, a white picket fence around the house, kids running around, kid-friendly get-togethers, and an abundance of family and friends. And everything went to hell in a single night. I am 30 years old, and I have been married to the most amazing husband, friend, and lover a woman could ask for for the past five years. I'm currently waiting to find out if my spouse will grant me a second chance or file for divorce. Do I merit another opportunity? Most likely not. I might as well share my story with you. Tommy and I were married right out of college. Larry, Brian, Keith, and Associates, WDB and Associates, were new employers to me. I was running late on my first day of a new job. I hit Tommy Campbell after slamming on the brakes as I sped past the stop sign. I hit him as he was moving his tools from his vehicle to the house he was working on. Tom turned out to be fine, but the police and ambulance arrived, and my insurance premium increased. He did indeed have a broken leg and other bruises, but he was still alive. That's a good thing, then. Nevertheless, I hurried over to check on him and the rest is history. After two years of dating, we were married. Life was nice, Tom and I were content and had begun discussing the possibility of becoming parents. I was making decent money and had a good job. It is worth mentioning that Tommy, together with his twin brothers Jimmy and Timmy, owns a construction company. They work on larger projects as well as home renovations. They have five people working for them, plus their sister Tina, who serves as secretary. Connie, Jimmy's spouse, handles payroll and other tax-related tasks for the brothers. The brothers' construction company is the name of the business. They have another brother who chose a different path. Jonathan, the lawyer, is neither John nor Johnny. Not simply any attorney, a cunning attorney. He's never lost a case, I believe. He has assisted the brothers in resolving conflicts arising from contracts or non-payment by clients. Let us now discuss WBD and Associates. They have been featured on the front cover of every financial journal. They provide a variety of financial services, including real estate, investments, M&A, and contract law. They are huge and extremely wealthy. They are some pretty well-known clients of the firm. Every partner is accompanied by an assistant. Barb works for Brian, Mary for Keith, and I for Larry. I sometimes take Larry out to lunch, but it's a formal affair. The company also employs managers, secretaries, employees, and directors. With Larry, Brian, and Keith included, the firm has 40 employees in total. We are wonderfully taken care of and treated like family by WDB. For instance, the company offers a wellness program through which we can receive up to $2,000 in annual reimbursement for any medical expenses. The company also features a daycare facility on site. The firm hosts BBQs and family holiday celebrations. The Christmas party, too, is a major occasion. Bonuses are given out by hand. It's not direct deposit. Instead, Larry, Brian, and Keith give each employee a card with a check inside and tell them how well they performed for the company this year. It is really affable. We genuinely resemble one large, content family. Every month on the final Friday, the firm hosts an office party as well. The employees are the guests of our workplace parties. Though it's not set in stone, that's simply how things have always been. At 5 o'clock, pencils go down and food and copious amounts of booze are brought in. Additionally, the firm covers each person's home Uber ride. There is some flirting even though the firm operates in a highly professional manner, particularly at our office gatherings. However, nothing improper like stroking and kissing. It's just enough to suggest, maybe there's something going on between those two. Furthermore, it was commonly assumed that Larry was sleeping with Carrie, his former assistant. Nobody was certain, and nobody wanted to lose their job for speaking honestly. Because her spouse was offered a new job, Carrie moved to a new location with him. Some believed they moved because Carrie's husband had discovered the truth. Larry asked me to take over as his new assistant. For the past five years, I have assisted Larry, and I have worked with WDB for seven years. Larry is an educated, attractive 55-year-old, and wealthy. Rich, did I mention that? Every other woman in the office and I both think of George Clooney when we see Larry. Larry is also aware of it. Larry has consistently exhibited professionalism and respect. However, I have witnessed him observing me and the other female employees. If I claimed I didn't look into him as well, I would be lying. That being said, I do anything for Larry. I sometimes feel like he needs someone to look after him in order to operate. Despite his intelligence, he is too busy for anything else. I book his dinner and buy presents for his wife on their anniversary. Every morning at 5 o'clock, Larry checks his phone to see if I've texted him. I inform him if the date is significant. Regarding business matters, I arrange all of Larry's phone calls, meetings, and travel. I do stuff like take his calls and answer them. I also need to be fully informed about the firm's significant clientele. I am aware of their birthdays, anniversaries, children's dates of birth, home and work addresses, and preferred wines and cigars. I see to the satisfaction of the firm's principal clients. I simply had no idea how joyful I was making them. We'll address the latter later. Aside from all I do for Larry, I also have the authority to authorize office spending for things like the office party, as long as they are reasonable. 
I am also in charge of a lot of the client events, in particular, the golf outings with clients. I ended up in some problems because of those client golf outings, and I had to ask Jonathan for assistance. Without getting too ahead of myself, Jonathan and the Campbell family no longer think highly of me. In particular, Tommy. Since my issue originated with the monthly workplace parties, let's talk about them again. I might have consumed a bit too much alcohol during the previous office party. My intoxicated behavior might have been influenced by the fact that I was taking medication for a cold. As the party was coming to a conclusion, I stayed behind and found myself flat on my back on Larry's office couch as he was chatting with me. Well, one thing led to another. No, I never thought something like this would occur. Larry and I are married, and he is a highly professional person. Our little excursion with the affair didn't go well. Jose, the tidy office worker, noticed our liaison when he came in. Larry requested Jose to stay outside for a moment while he turned on a blank light over me. Larry is a real class act. I was so inebriated that Larry had his car service carry me home. I kissed George, her, Larry goodnight and slept in the car. Luke, Larry's driver, literally carried me to the front door when we got to my house. I arrived home around 1 in the morning. Tommy was asleep in bed, which pleased me. The following morning, I was lying on top of the bed, partially dressed, and suffering from a severe headache. I eventually got out of bed around 11. When I came down to the kitchen, Tommy was in there making me a hangover concoction. To make sure I was nice and clean, I took a shower first. You get the idea. I was slowly remembering what I had done the night before by this time. Last night, I was hoping for George Clooney in my dream. However, it was neither a dream nor George Clooney. I sobbed and ran to the bathroom to throw up. Tommy simply assumed that I would pass out from the drink and didn't ask any questions. As I made my way back into the kitchen, Tommy was merely shaking his head at me. He made me remember that I was no longer a college student. I was extremely sorry for what I had done. Tommy and I spent the whole weekend sleeping as much as possible, and on Monday morning I reminded him before heading to work. When I arrived at work on Monday morning, nothing seemed to have happened. Larry was acting like himself. We had our usual interaction as I went about my business. Nothing humorous was said to me by anyone at work, it was just business as usual. Over the following three weeks, everything returned to normal. Aside from forming bonds, I was aware that this would eventually occur. I wanted to cherish every moment I could spend with Tommy because I knew my marriage wasn't going to endure much longer. As you can see, Tommy employs Jose as brother. I knew it would only be a matter of time until Tommy confronted me after Jose told his brother. Tommy took me by the hand one evening after he got home from work and showed me to the bedroom. I assumed he was looking to have fun. Given how much time we've spent together over the previous three weeks, it seemed obvious to me. I was in error. Tommy instructed me to pack my belongings after placing my luggage and several duffel bags on the bed. He then informed me that my sister was awaiting me and that he had already called her. To my surprise, Tommy had been quite columnist, which made me a bit uneasy. He occasionally loses his anger. He has never struck me or done anything like. But most people find that a tall guy can be a little intimidating. Tommy assisted me in loading my luggage and bags into my car as I sobbed as I packed my baggage. I apologized to Tommy and asked if we could speak. Tommy simply turned and left. My sister Lisa and her husband Jerry weren't pleased to see me when I knocked on their door. He objected to my staying at their home. Jerry was abhorred by me, but Lisa refused to back down and assured him I would be staying. After telling them the entire tale, Lisa said, when did you start drinking so much? I explained to her that I had had a few glasses of wine but that I was taking medicine for a cold. Lisa questioned if I told Tommy about it. I informed her that there was silence. Tommy just instructed me to get packing. Jerry questioned me about why, at the time, I hadn't told Tommy. Then, since I already knew Tommy would find out, I just chose to make the most of our time together before it ended. Tommy had said to me when we first got married, if either of us ever cheated on the other, why we did it doesn't matter, our marriage would be over. There would be no acceptable excuse. I attempted to speak with Tommy throughout the week. I wanted an opportunity to tell him what had transpired. But I knew in my heart that he would not listen to me. He never picked up when I texted or called. The fact that Tommy is aware that Larry resembles George Clooney exacerbates the situation. Tommy would always warn me to stay away from the false George Clooney and to dream about the real one. When Tommy and I would joke around, I would always say George Clooney if I could have chilled with anyone. Tommy's answer would be Maggie, our favorite bartender at Charlie's Bar and Grill. Tommy took very little time to serve me. The conditions were reasonable. Tommy had everything I owned packaged up and dropped off to a storage facility because he didn't want to see me. The divorce agreement envelope contained the facility's address and lock combination. I had to get a lawyer now. Jerry was hesitant to give me the name of his buddy Laura Crown, who I paid to speak on my behalf, but Lisa forced him to do so. Laura was incredibly understanding and I liked her. She also believed Tommy was being unkind to me by not speaking with me. We reviewed the contract and a list of everything Tommy and I owned. It was easy because we don't have children. Tommy desired the residence. I wouldn't force Tommy to sell the house that he and his brothers had constructed for us as a wedding gift. 
Since he was keeping the house, furnishings, and other possessions, he offered me 65% of our money. We were to split our stocks, bonds, and other investments in half. I'd keep my retirement, and Tommy would keep his. The business came next. Tommy tried to buy me out, but I was entitled to half of his business. I assured Laura that I wouldn't sell my portion. I reasoned that Tommy would eventually need to speak with me if I had any ownership stake in the company. I informed Laura that I didn't want a divorce. She said we could put off signing the divorce decree, but Tommy's brother Jonathan would make me sign it or take us to court. Jonathan was pushing me to sign the divorce decree, and Tommy was still refusing to speak to me. I was still wishing for more time. Laura, thus, altered the asset division from 65% to 66%. I realize it was foolish, but Jonathan drew up and filed new divorce papers with the court. In addition, Laura informed Jonathan that she would be taking a two-week vacation. This allowed me to attempt and converse to Tommy for a bit longer. Tommy refused to talk to me even after that, but Tommy's younger sister Tina did. Tina was against Tommy divorcing me. The anecdote was known to the whole Campbell family. Tommy's side had the bothers, while my side included Tina and the sisters-in-law. There was some tension between the spouses because of me. His parents showed no emotion. Their only concern was Tommy's happiness. Tina did offer me some hope, letting me know that Tommy had at last settled down and stopped smashing things and screaming at his employees. She also advised me to continue putting off signing the divorce decree since it would annoy Tommy and Jonathan and give Timmy's wife, Tina, Connie, and Tanya more time to continue working on Tommy. I had returned to my employment, working hard and trying to survive during all of this. Larry knew Tommy had thrown me out, even though he hadn't spoken to me about it. Even the meeting he was having with Jonathan to talk about a settlement through the courts was scheduled by me. I had no idea how long I would be employed. Other than Brian and Keith, Barb and Mary were the only people in the office who knew what had transpired, and they were furious with Larry. They said that since Larry had taken advantage of me when I was intoxicated, they ought to have intervened and just driven me home. It wasn't their fault, I reassured them. They assured me that should I choose to sue the firm, they would support me. It seems that Barb and Mary were the targets of Brian and Keith's advances several years ago, much as Larry had been to me and his former aide Carrie. Saying they would sue if it went on, they both put an end to it. They also revealed to me that Keith and Brian had an affair with two of the secretaries. It appears that the office was not as formal as I had assumed. Although I truly enjoyed my work, good things must come to an end. Tommy filed a lawsuit against the company. There was a strong non-fraternization policy at the firm. An employee and her husband separated as a result of Larry, a partner, having an affair with her. Jonathan was threatening to make it public if the company didn't accept the absurd compensation he presented. Jonathan was eager for it to end. Tommy was had to sign a contract promising not to tell Larry's wife or discuss the situation in public. Larry's marriage would endure, Tommy received a very good payout, and my marriage was over. How did I end myself in this situation so badly? I went from being a contented married wife with a wonderful career to being alone and jobless in less than five weeks. Indeed, I was called into Larry's office when he told me he had to let go. Although Larry expressed regret and accepted full responsibility for the incident, he was unable to keep me employed at the company. I would be too much of a distraction, he added. To be sure, Larry gave me a generous severance payout when he let me go. I would receive two more years' worth of income and bonus in addition to my remaining money for the year provided I agreed to sign a document promising to keep our encounter a secret from his wife. Moreover, I could continue to have health insurance until I found another employment. I could afford to locate an apartment and I didn't have to worry about getting a job for a long thanks to this arrangement. Staying at my sister's apartment wasn't right. Larry gave me a copy of the signed contract and a check for the entire amount. In addition, he told me that I was welcome to stay for the remainder of the day and that I may expect questions when I left. The following day, he informed the workplace that I had chosen to take a break and go on a self-discovery. Discover who I am. Maybe get myself an ice cream tub and an apartment. I sent Laura a copy of the agreement I had signed and informed her of my termination the next day. She didn't think there was anything wrong with it, especially because it didn't stop Tommy from suing the firm on the grounds of its stringent non-fraternization policy. To further postpone the divorce, Laura continued to play games with Jonathan. We required a fresh copy of the divorce agreement since, as she even admitted to Jonathan, her dog ate it. Finally, Jonathan lost it, and we had to appear before a court. I told the judge the complete story during our unofficial meeting and stated that I did not want a divorce. Tommy was told by the court, who thought divorces were absurd, that he had to attend counseling or spend a week in jail. The judge then informed Tommy that he would have to come back before him in a week and would be given the same punishments. Tommy refused to speak to me or even look at me. Tommy accepted to counseling a week later. It had been ten weeks since that Friday night that I had been hanging out with Larry when we met with the counselor. When Tommy entered the counselor's office, I felt uneasy. I was sitting there, waiting for Tommy. I greeted hi to Tommy as he entered, but he never looked at me. I asked him if he wanted to sit on the couch next to me and how he was doing. 
It was as though I hadn't even entered the room as he gave me the cold shoulder. Following our introduction, our counselor Bonnie asked each of us to explain to her the purpose of our visit and the goals we had for the sessions. Tommy didn't seem to even want to be there, so I asked if I could talk first. I told Bonnie everything, thus, I didn't mince any words. I told her about that night, about George Clooney, about the drugs, and even about how we told Tommy that the dog had eaten the divorce papers so that I might have more time. That really tickled her. I had to throw up when I suddenly jumped up and hurried to the bathroom. Tommy asked me calmly, how long? After I returned and took a seat, I answered him, 10 weeks. He pulled away from me as I tried to hold him. So, it could be my child or Larry's. Yes, I replied. Then Tommy stated he would not desert the child if it was his, telling us that if the baby is Larry's the divorce would be final and I would rather go to jail than counseling. Tommy and I are expecting twins, I told him. He said, you may not be having twins but without DNA proof we aren't having anything together and until I see DNA proof, I will not talk to you or see you. I guess that went nicely. He never stated he would take me back, even though he promised not to desert the babies. It was now just a case of wait and see. Tommy was not returning my calls or texts, so I kept attempting to talk to him. Jimmy was having a lot of arguments with Connie, Timmy, and Tanya, so they were unable to see me. But Tina was unfazed. Tina tried to spend as much time as she could with me. Tommy was not interested in hearing from Tina when she tried to update him on my pregnancy. Naturally, my sister treated me very well and insisted that I remain at the house with her, her husband, and their two kids, Sean and Stephanie. As my due date drew nearer, my parents planned to visit and stay with us. It astonished me too to hear from Larry on a few occasions. I maintained in touch with Terry and Barb, and they notified Larry that I was pregnant. Larry would constantly check in with me to see how I was doing and reassure me that the firm's health coverage would take care of everything. Additionally, he informed me that even though he would create a college fund for the babies if they were his, he would still have another plan for me or the kids. Despite having a chaotic existence, I was very well off, with a salary and bonus for the previous two and a half years, healthcare, and now a college fund. Tommy's pardon was all I required. Tommy was kind of giving up on me, even though I kept trying to talk to him. Tommy enjoyed my apple pie every time. I then began to bake apple pies and leave them at the residence. I'm not sure if he threw it out or ate them. Still, I persisted in doing it. Tommy and the employees would get lunch sandwiches from me, which I would then deliver to the job site. I was thanked by the boys, but Tommy would hop into his pickup and head out. Tina kept stopping by to check on me and see how I was doing. She expressed her excitement to me about spending time with the infants. Tina stated, even if the babies are Larry's, Tommy is wrong for walking away from you. I will treat the babies as if they are my nieces. Tina also informed me that Tommy's refusal to at least text me to check on me was starting to irritate the sisters-in-laws as well. Thus, while things were progressing and I was growing larger, I was still able to move around. Even though I was consuming the apple pies before they reached Tommy's house, I was still cooking them. There had been a knock on the door around five weeks prior. After answering the door, Lisa quickly came to me in the den and said, this is for you. Then she promised to call Laura, didn't she? I rushed to the door to find out who was calling Laura and why Lisa was doing so. There were two FBI agents at the door. Is your name Karen Campbell? She said, yes, my name is Karen Campbell. We drove away after they said, please come with us, and got into their sedan's back seat. They led me into a conference room in their office and informed me that they had some questions for me. I just said, I want to talk to my lawyer, since I watch a lot of those TV police dramas. It felt like an eternity when I was left alone in a room. Then, much to my astonishment, Jonathan and Laura entered. Laura was about to say something when Jonathan interrupted her. Jonathan said, the only reason I'm here is because Tommy doesn't want his babies to be born in prison. Prison, why am I being sent there? I was told by Jonathan to just sit there and keep quiet. After a quiet 10 minutes or so, Jonathan got up and knocked on the door. When the two FBI officers entered, Jonathan was acting irrationally. How dare you hold a pregnant woman against her will in a looked room with nothing to drink or permit he the use of the bathroom. They exchanged a look and said they were unaware of my pregnancy. Jonathan answered, a blind man can see that she is pregnant. Look at how big she is. It looks like she's carrying children in their swing set. The FBI agents said nothing, but gazed. Names, I want your names and want your names now. And my client is leaving. If you need to speak with my client, you go through me or arrest her. Good luck finding enough evidence and don't give me that crap that you can hold her for 24 hours either. I'll take the two idiots in front of any judge and I'll humiliate both of you along with this whole office. You'll be working in the mailroom before I'm done with you. Laura and I exchanged a look as though we didn't know who this man was. Following Jonathan's tantrum, I was led to the restroom and given two bottles of water as I left. I brought Laura along when I visited with Jonathan the following day at his office. Although she's not a defense lawyer, we've become such close friends over the last six months that I asked her if she would accompany me. I was a little afraid of Jonathan too. Upon arriving at his office, Jonathan had returned to his professional self. We were asked if we wanted tea, coffee, or water by his secretary. 
When Jonathan was calm, he inquired about my emotional state. We then discussed the FBI's allegations. I said, I know of them, and I was the one who scheduled and planned them, in response to the statement. It appears that WBD and Associates holds various client events throughout the year. Jonathan went on to tell me that one of the firm's clients, a CFO, forced by his wife who threatened him with divorce, approached the federal government with claims of misconduct by WBD and Associates. He claimed that WBD holds various golf outings throughout the year and supply drugs for those who want to partake in female entertainment, who will perform anything they so desire. It appears that WBD also takes pictures and videos just in case a little blackmailing to retain client contracts are needed. This unnamed CFO gave names of the others that had attended, but his claims have all been denied. This CFO, again under pressure from his wife or divorce, if she finds that he is lying, gave up your name since you are the one that coordinated the events. According to Jonathan, the FBI is scaring me into saying something that would implicate WBD, and if I didn't cooperate, they threatened to indict me, which would only be a fear tactic, according to Jonathan. I was crying in an emotional mess by now. So far, Jonathan has managed to fend off the FBI until the birth of my children. He informed me that he intended to sue the FBI for allegedly imprisoning a pregnant woman, putting my pregnancy and the lives of my unborn children in jeopardy. Would he be able to achieve that? I asked. He did as he stated he could. He estimated that the babies would be three or four months old by the time everything calmed down. However, he said that I would eventually need to speak with the FBI. Jonathan is behaving more politely toward me now. He assured me that he would still stand in for me even if the babies weren't Tommy's. I understand that this is unrelated to your inquiry, is your spouse on his way. But I didn't want to be by myself here. All I needed was a companion to sit with. My spouse, who might or might not be my baby's father, refuses to interact with me until he learns for sure if he is their father. My parents live in Florida, and my sister and her husband did not postpone their vacation to Jamaica because I was not due to give birth to my babies for another two weeks. Next week, they take off. I tried to talk to my 24-year-old sister-in-law over the phone. I was unable to comprehend a single thing she said. She sounded like she was halfway there, so I'm assuming she was out at a bar. To go to the hospital, I had to dial for help. So, I'm by myself here. Honey, you shouldn't be alone on one of the happiest days of your life. My name is Dottie, and I will stay with you and hold your hand until those little babies are born. The doctor should be in shortly. I'm grateful. I'm not trying to upset you, but you might want to reconsider before you decide to get back together with your husband. I know you love him, but he sounds very selfish to me. He abandoned you. He knows there's a chance these babies are his, but he hasn't been there throughout your pregnancy, and he isn't here now. And honey, I've been a nurse for over 30 years, I have three children of my own, and I have helped to deliver and care for hundreds of babies. I've seen happy couples, I've seen nervous couples, and I've seen mamas who are just babies themselves. They come in with only their parents or a friend. But this is the first time I have ever seen a beautiful mama in the delivery room all alone. My comment, she is pregnant, probably by her lover, and she has the gall to think he is being unfair. The husband did not even go nuclear. He did not leave town. He did not go after her, her job or her boss. What a timeline. We will see an update tomorrow about what happens next and what will happen to her soon.